This is Together Through the Bible, a weekly study of the scriptures designed to help the Christian grow in faith and character. In just a moment, we'll join our teacher, Tom Terry, as he begins today's study. But first, we want to let you know about free resources available to you to aid you in your knowledge of the Bible and how you can receive a DVD copy of this study. Each of the weekly Together Through the Bible studies have a matching Bible study worksheet you can use to aid you in your study of God's Word. All study guides are free, available online at eagletv.mn. Each four-page study guide contains the major highlights of the weekly study, scripture references, and practical questions to help you apply what you learn from these studies. The guides can also be used with your church or cell group. You can download your free copy of this week's study guide at eagletv.mn. In addition to the free study guides, each episode of Together Through the Bible is also available online Watch it in its entirety in Mongolian or English. And if you missed part of today's study or an episode or want to view the study again, just go to eagletv.mn and click on the Bible Studies link and then choose the study you want to watch. At the end of this program, we'll tell you how you can order a copy of this study on DVD along with the study notes and extra materials to help you in your spiritual growth want to have pen and paper ready at the end of the program for that information. Now let's join our instructor, Tom Terry. Like many Americans, I grew up in a family that suffered from divorce, but experienced the joy of new marriage. In my family, I have a mother and my brother. I also have a stepfather and two stepsisters. All through my early years, I knew many families that were like mine, where one parent was absent or perhaps had even abandoned the family and a new person came in to become a new spouse, a new parent. Most of my friends that had stepfathers or stepmothers usually called their original mother or father by their common title, mom or dad, but they called their stepparent by their first name. In my house, things were very different. When my mother and my stepfather got married, my brother and I did not call our stepfather by his first name Richard. That seemed wrong to us. We saw him as the man who not only loved our mother and was committing his life to her, but we recognized that he also loved us and he was committing himself to be a father to me and my brother. Therefore, it seemed only natural for us to call him dad. All through our remaining years as children, teenagers, and even today as adults, whenever we think of a father, we do not think of our biological father. We always think of our stepfather, our dad. In fact, it never occurs to us to think of our biological father as dad. Referring to him by that title seems awkward, almost wrong. Since he abandoned us many years ago, we had no relationship with him as a father. But the stranger, the man who came later, the one who chose by his own free will to embrace us with love and commitment, that man became our dad. In fact, not only did he become our dad, but his daughters even became our sisters and it never occurs to us to think of them as anything but our sisters, as if they were our own flesh and blood. A Christian's relationship with God is very similar to that of an adoptive father who redeems a broken home. Many people who are from broken homes know conceptually what a father is, but they may not know by experience what it means to have the love of a father who chooses to love them. So too, a person who looks at creation around him may understand the world and all that is in it has a creator. But unless he experiences that creator reaching out to him to let him experience him firsthand, that person can only know the creator conceptually. If my stepfather had not married my mother and freely decided of his own will to become a father to my brother and I, we might never have known from firsthand experience what it was like to have a loving father at home. Through his decision to become a father to us, we came to know what a father is supposed to be like. So too in our spiritual lives, unless God draws us to himself and he reveals himself to us, we might be able to know that he exists, but without his free choice to reveal himself, we could never experience him personally. On today's edition of Together Through the Bible, we're going to continue our five-part series on what the Bible teaches about humanity. For today's study, we will examine the subject of the redemption of man. Just as my home needed the redemptive effects of a father to bring wholeness to our family, so too you and I need a Savior to redeem us from the effects of sin and the brokenness of separation from God. 
as we dive into our subject, the redemption of man, we will take a look at God's grace, how God reveals Himself to us, and how by receiving God's special grace and special revelation, we can know and experience the joys of redemption by a loving Heavenly Father. So let's begin the first part of our study on redemption by looking at common grace. Bible teachers have many ways of explaining how God redeems man. There are many technical terms and definitions that are not actually used in the Bible, but they are used by theologians and teachers to help describe and define God's activity. One of those terms is common grace. In general, when we talk about the grace of God, we're talking about God's unmerited favor to man. God is merciful to those who are in trouble, who need help, but He shows grace to the guilty, those who sin, and who live a life without God. There are two kinds of grace that God shows to man. The first kind of grace is the common grace of God, the expression of goodness that God shows to all people everywhere at all times through the created order. All people are recipients of God's common grace. Common grace is usually overlooked by sinful man. Since the modern world has been overcome with the ideas of atheism or naturalism, many people view life and the world around them without a deep sense of the supernatural. Yet God's demonstration of common grace is all around us. That is, God's demonstration of His goodness to the family of humanity is evident if we only take a moment to recognize it. For that which is known about God is evident among them. For God has made it evident. For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. Beyond recognizing that God has provided for a revelation of Himself through creation, how does God demonstrate His goodness through creation? Let's look at a few examples in the scripture of God's goodness to man, regardless of man's sin. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the labor of man so that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine which makes a man's heart glad so that he may make his face glisten with oil and food which sustains a man's heart. There are two reasons why God shows common grace to all men, whether they believe in Him or not. First, by maintaining a created order which brings benefit to all people, God is demonstrating His identity as the one and only true God. For if there were multiple deities that made or controlled the world, certainly the world would be in chaos from the competition among those deities. The goodness of creation expresses the goodness of a single God. Second, God shows common grace to all men that they might recognize who He is through His created order. We call this kind of revelation through common grace, natural revelation. Since God's intention for His common grace is to lead man to a knowledge of Himself, then we can make an important deduction about this truth. In fact, we can make two deductions. First, if common grace is God's goodness to all people leading to a knowledge of Himself, then it stands to reason that God must want to give us a knowledge beyond that which is common to all men. For why else would He want us to gain a new knowledge beyond what is commonly known? Second, if that new knowledge is something different from what is commonly known about God through common grace and natural revelation, then it also stands to reason that there is a unique and special property to that knowledge. Common grace leads to natural revelation, which can lead to God's special revelation and special grace. Before we get too far, let's further define what these terms mean. We've already learned that God's common grace is the demonstration of His goodness to all people everywhere at all times, regardless of faith confession. But there are three other terms that we've used that require definition. Natural revelation is what we receive when we recognize God's common grace. When we recognize His goodness to us in creation, we recognize Him as the Creator. Nature reveals the Creator to us. 
This is called natural revelation. Special revelation goes beyond natural revelation. Special revelation is the work of the Holy Spirit revealing God's specific identity to man, at the same time convicting man about the truth of who Jesus Christ is. All special revelation comes from the Holy Spirit. This includes the special revelation of the Bible's text, the inner conviction of the Holy Spirit when a person believes the truth about Christ, and the ongoing guidance of the Spirit in the believer to conform the Christian's character to be like Jesus. Jesus described special revelation in John 16, 8 through 9, when he says of the Holy Spirit, He will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Special grace also goes beyond common grace. Only those who have received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior have experienced special grace. Special grace is the free, unmerited, unearned forgiveness that God gives through Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul describes the effect of special grace in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of works that no one should boast. Common grace and special grace are related in that one is ideally supposed to lead to the other. However, this does not always happen. Whether or not a person receives special grace depends upon whether a person's heart is open to receiving God's grace by special revelation. In defining these terms of common grace and special grace, we should be very careful to remember the most significant difference between the two. Common grace cannot redeem man, but it can prepare man to receive special grace and thereby be redeemed. Just because a person says they perceive or commune with God through nature, or recognize God's existence, or even attend church, does not mean that such a person has been redeemed from their sin or has eternal life. Jesus revealed that there will be some people who seem to have experienced God's special grace, but in fact, they are self-deceived. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform miracles? And I will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There are many people who have a knowledge of God through common grace and natural revelation who regularly attend church and they even help out with Christian service. Many of these people serve God believing that they are earning God's favor. However, God's favor cannot be earned by the unbeliever or the believer. God's favor is given solely upon his decision to be gracious to whom he will be gracious. When a person, however, genuinely surrenders his or her life to Jesus Christ with a heartfelt desire to have Jesus Christ as Lord over every area of life, then that person can be said to be the recipient of God's special grace. Now let's review the first three principles about God's common grace. All people are recipients of God's common grace. Common grace leads to natural revelation, which can lead to God's special revelation and special grace. Common grace cannot redeem man, but it can prepare man to receive special grace and thereby be redeemed.